Hello everybody, this is Jörg once again from YouTube channel Jogger66 with another episode of the reading of Rulers of Evil from Tapa Saucy. We have arrived after the beautiful chapter 19 and 20, even in two parts, almost two hours long, chapter 20, at chapter 21, which is called Jupiter's Earthly Abode. Without any further ado, I will start reading Jupiter's Earthly Abode. Rome's God of Gods, Jupiter, was served in the temples called Capitolia, from the Latin word meaning head. This is, by the way, where you get the, head, where you get the word decapitated from, from capital. As if we've seen, America's Temple of Jupiter was erected on land that had been known as Rome for more than a hundred years before it was selected by Daniel Carroll's Federal City Committee from properties, from properties owned by Carroll himself. Subdividing the Federal City, or District of Columbia, into plats was the task of an artistic Parisian engineer named Pierre Charles L'Enfant. According to Dr. James Walsh in his book American Jesuits, L'Enfant got the job through the intercession of his priest, John Carroll, which, as I want to remind you of, is America's first Catholic bishop and the founder of Georgetown University, one of the hidden founding fathers, one of the, peoples, one of the people you are never taught in your history class in school. Or university. L'Enfant was a Freemason. He subdivided the city into a brilliant array of Kabbalistic symbols and numerics. Perhaps his best known device is the pattern that is discerned when a straight line is drawn from the White House along Connecticut Avenue to DuPont Circle, then along Massachusetts Avenue to Mount Vernon, uh, to Mount Vernon Square, then back across K Street to Washington Circle, then up Rhode Island Avenue to Logan Circle, then along Vermont Avenue back to the White House. What results is a perfect pentagram, you know, the five-pointed star, the Queen of Heaven's eight-year and one-day celestial journey. But L'Enfant's pentagram points downward, forming the shape of Baphomet, the Gnostic quote-unquote absorption into wisdom, goat's head icon of the Knights Templar. Gnostic historian Manly P. Hall says the upside-down pentagram, quote, is used extensively in black magic and always signifies a perverted power, unquote. The Baphomet imposed upon the federal city by Pierre Charles L'Enfant puts the mouth of its perverted power exactly at the White House. Now, maybe this is another way how you can interpret the lamb that spake as a dragon from Revelation 13. Think about it, how all these things connect together when you have the real knowledge. It's quite interesting, in my opinion. The author continues on page 228. The presence of perverted power is underscored in L'Enfant numbering of Washington's city blocks. The 600 series of blocks run in a swath, meaning row or line, from Q Street North through the Capitol grounds down to the, uh, to the mouth of James Creek below V Street South. All the numbers between 600 and 699 are assigned to blocks within this swath, except for the number 666. That number is missing from the map. It must have been secretly affixed to the only unnumbered section of blocks in the 600 series. That section, we find, includes the capital grounds that once were called Rome. Of course, 666 is, quote-unquote, the number of the name of the beast, mentioned in the 13th chapter of Revelation. If America's Temple of Jupiter sits upon the beast named 666, could it be that the true founding fathers, you know, the ones you're never taught about, soberly recognized Congress as the great whore of Revelation 17, verse 1? Well, 
I don't think that that's the case because that is Rome. But we are talking here of the image that is made of the beast, right? The great whore has an image in the United States of America. So maybe that's what they were pointing to. The Latin historians Ovid, Pliny and Aurelius Victor all tell us that the prehistoric name for Rome was Saturnia, quote, city of Saturn, unquote. Saturnia's original settlers came from the east, from Babylon. In the Babylonian or Chaldean language, according to Alexander Hislop, and in his book The Two Babylons, Saturnia was pronounced Satr, S-A-T-R, but spelled with only four characters, S-T-U-R, stir. Now, Chaldean, like Hebrew, Greek, and to a limited extent, Latin, had no separate numbering system. Their numbers were represented by certain characters of their alphabet. The Kabbalah derives its power from mathematical energies conveyed from these languages. Hislop reported a phenomenon that he said, quote, every Chaldee scholar knew, unquote, which is that the letters of Stir, Rome's earliest name, totaled 666, the S standing for 60, the T standing for 400, the U standing for R, uh, for, for 6, sorry, and the R standing for 200. So you got 60, 400, 6 and 200. Matches up to 666. Hislop further reported that the Roman numerals consist of only 6 letters. D, which stands for 500. C, which stands for 100. L, which stands for 50. X, stands for 10. V, stands for 5 and I resembling the 1. We ignore the letter M, signifying 1000, because it's a latecomer, having, in, uh, having evolved as shorthand for two Ds. When we total these six letters, D, C, L, X, V, and I, we discover a startling link with the beast of revelation embedded in the very alphanumeric communication system of the Romans. D500 plus C100 plus L50 plus X10 plus V5 plus I1 is 500, 100, 50, 10, 5 and 1 gives you 666. Demonism, black magic and perverted power formatted into the streets of the federal city? Are you kidding me? Are you, are you sure? Demonism, black magic and perverted power formatted into the streets of the federal city of a protestant country? Well, as Michael Novak, who we learned on in chapter 20, as you probably remember, as Michael Novak observed, the indispensable task of the founding fathers was to build a republic designed for sinners. Not all sinners can be governed with a loving call to repentance, with reason, logic, patience, understanding and forgiveness. Sin develops cunning villains who steal, rape, destroy, torture and kill. A republic designed for sinners must be up to the villainy of its meanest subject. This is why the great revolutionary pamphleteer Tom Paine candidly characterized human government as quote-unquote a necessary evil. Think about that. Thomas Paine characterized human government as a necessary evil. So why do we have human government? Because we don't want God's government anymore. Except for Bible-believing Christians. But the people out there, the sinners that all these republics, democracies and everything else is made for, the ones who want human government, well, it's a necessary evil, so they need to be ruled by evil. A government must necessarily be as evil as the evildoers it's charged with regulating, or it cannot protect the innocent. 
a very important point that Tapasosi makes here, and he goes into that into that interview also that I mentioned earlier from Greg Semensky from 2006. He says, it takes evil people to rule evil people. You cannot evil people get ruled by a good person. You cannot put a Bible-believing Christian in the presidency of the United States of America. He would be overrun. He would be laughed at. He would be killed on the spot. You cannot have good rule evil. That's an impossibility. A government must necessarily be as evil as the evildoers it's charged with, regulating or it cannot protect the innocent. This just stands to reason. Scripture shows the principle as divinely ordained. Yes, God ordained the evil to rule the good. But the details of this gracious ordination, which we'll be examining later, uh, presently, sorry, which we'll be ex uh, examining, examining presently, are so embarrassing to the flaunted piety of rulers that they must be concealed in Kabbalah. And why is that? Well, because if they told you that they are evilly ruling you, you would say, I don't want that. So they do it through signs and monuments and all these secret languages that you don't understand. But the result is the same, but you don't see it as evil because they sell it to you as good. Just like the motto of the Jesuits, when the Roman Catholic hierarchy tells me that white is black and black is white, I will believe so. You know, it all comes together. So soon after completing his master plan for the federal city, Pierre Charles L'Enfant became embroiled in a flagrant dispute with Bishop Carroll's high-ranking brother Daniel. The young engineer wanted an avenue to go where Daniel Carroll intended to build his new manor house. When Carroll refused to build elsewhere, L'Enfant ordered the work crew to tear down the new house. Before any significant damage could be done, however, President Washington dismissed L'Enfant. The whole affair diverted attention away from the demonic symbolism in L'Enfant's designs while conveniently removing him from public scrutiny. Again, blown cover as cover. Aye, you don't mess with a Jesuit, and surely not with his house, surely not with a carol. Blown cover as cover. The attention was totally taken away from the design L'Enfant used to make Washington a satanic city because of his dispute he had with Carroll. The designs were executed by his successor, Andrew Ellicott, without significant alteration. The former creation of Jupiter's American abode on Wednesday, September 18, 1793, was a jubilant affair. President George Washington and Capitol Commissioner Daniel Carroll, again the Carrolls, departed from the White House, marching side by side. They led a magnificent parade, quote, with music playing, drums beating and spectators rejoicing in one of the grandest Masonic processions which perhaps ever was exhibited on the like important occasion, unquote. Arriving at the construction site on lot 666, Commissioner Carroll presented, quote, Worshipful Master Washington, unquote, a large silver plaque and engraved with the following words. Quote, this southeast cornerstone of the capital of the United States of America in the city of Washington was laid on the 18th of December in the 13th year of American independence, in the first year of the second term of the presidency of George Washington, whose virtues in the civil administration of his country have been as conspicuous and beneficial as his military valor and prudence have been useful in establishing her liberties, and in the year of masonry, 
5,793 by the President of the United States in concert with the Grand Lodge of Maryland, several lodges under its jurisdiction and Lodge No. 22 from Alexandria, Virginia. Unquote. President Washington then descended to a builder's trench prepared for the Capitol's foundations, laid the plaque on the ground and covered it over with a cornerstone. The cornerstone was a massive rock cut from Eagle Quarry, a property in Aquia Creek in Virginia, owned by the family of, ah, uh, take a guess, Daniel Carroll's nephew. Robert Brandt. So again, we got the Carols involved. Then, just as the priests of Jupiter might have blessed their Capitolia two millennia ago, three worshipful masters consecrated the stone with corn, wine, and oil. Washington and the other, mas uh, and the other masters stepped out of the trench and joined the assembled throng to listen to a patriotic speech. Afterward, said the Gazette, quote, the congregation joined in reverential prayer, which was succeeded by Masonic chanting honors and a fifteen volley from the artillery. Then the participants retired to a barbecue at which a five hundred pound ox was roasted, and those in attendance generally partook with every abundance of other recreation. Unquote. Now it gets interesting. Reading of the Barbecue. We are going back to chapter 20. Reading of the Barbecue, the author continues, I was reminded of the passage in the Aeneid, where Julius Ascanius promised a sacrifice to Jupiter for favoring his rebellious undertaking. Remember? Anuit coeptis? Favoring this undertaking? I shall bring to thy temple gifts in my own hands, and place a white bullock at the altar. Unquote. Remember that reading from chapter 20? Quote, I shall bring to thy temple gifts in my own hands. Isn't that exactly what Cain did? Do you see the resemblance here? He brought gifts from his own hands instead of his brother who brought a first fruit, a lamb, to offer, to sacrifice for the glory of God. I shall bring to thy temple gifts in my own hands and place a white bullock at thy altar. Unquote. Could it be that the silver plague, the corn, the wine, the oil, the chanting, the roasted ox and the reverential prayer were the fulfillment of that promise? A burnt sacrifice to Jupiter on the altar of his Capitolium upon land called Rome, land formerly consecrated by Pontifex Maximus, to the protection of the goddess Venus? Historians who believe the government of the United States was founded by Christians will certainly disagree. But the ceremony, as reported in the press, was anything but Christian. Anything but Christian. Moreover, the plague itself reckoned time according to three systems. First, the years of independence of the United States. You remember? Thirteen. Second, the years of George Washington's administration. Well, first year of his second term. And third, the years of Freemasonry, 5,793 or something. It completely, completely ignored the system that reckons time in the years of Jesus Christ. Eight years after the sacrifice, Congress met in the Capitol for the first time. Washington gave the appearance of a Roman Catholic settlement. The most imposing houses in the city belonged to Daniel Carroll and his brother-in-law, secularized Jesuit priest Notley Young. The city's mayor was Carroll's nephew, Robert Brent, who was also purveying stone for most of the federal buildings, as we just read before. You know, 
he has this um, uh, where, where they put out that query stone there. Over on the west side of town stood Georgetown College, established by Bishop John Carroll in 1789, 13 years after the independence of the United States of America from the Great Britain Empire. Georgetown quickly became the foremost incubator of federal policy, foreign and domestic. It is still, today, not only at the time of the writing of this book from Tapasasi, today, 2015, administered by the Society of Jesus. Now you can see a picture of the seal of the Black Papacy's Georgetown University as it appears today on a campus security vehicle. The Roman eagle grasps both the world and the cross, state and Roman Catholic Church, combining state and church. The banner and its beak declaring ultra unum, both together. That is a combination of state and church. That is everything but Protestant policy. That is pure Roman Catholic policy. Not Christian. When Pope Pius VII restored the Society of Jesus in August 1814, former presidents John Adams and Thomas Jefferson exchanged comments. Quote, I do not like the resurrection of the Jesuit, wrote Adams. Quote, they have a general now in Russia, Tadeusz Prozosowski, in correspondence with the Jesuits in the United States, who are more numerous than everybody knows. Shall we not have swarms of them here in the shape of printers, editors, writers, schoolmasters, schoolmasters etc.? I have lately read Pascal's letter over again. You know, Blaise Pascal's provincial letters helped bring out the suppression of the Society of Jesus in the time, which I still am the opinion of, and never will change of that opinion, that the suppression of the Society of Jesus was planned all along by Lorenzo Ricci to get the Jesuits secularized, that they can come, as John Adams says here, can come over as printers, editors, writers, schoolmasters, lawyers, businessmen, bankers, everything else but recognizable priests from the Roman Catholic Church. The secularization of the Jesuits was so necessary for their endeavor. And something else that uh, you should think about. Most of the people identify the Roman Catholic Church first and for all with spirituality, with being a church, and not with a political power. And that's the problem. They do not see the political power the Roman Catholic Church has all over the world. That's why all the kings are obedient to the whore, to the papacy. Right? So, when you don't see that, the Roman Catholic Church is a political power as it is a spiritual power, then you do not see that the Jesuits, who are so-called a monastery, a order, a religious order within the Roman Catholic Church, are first and for all a civil power. You just don't tell people. You just take all these teachings away. You just cover it up. Blown cover by cover. That's what their whole history is all about. You don't see the political power of the Roman Catholic Church and you do not see the political power of the Jesuit order. And the military power they have. They control everything through papal knighthoods, starting with the sovereign military order of Malta. So Blaise Pascal's provincial letters helped bring about the suppression of the Society of Jesus, is mentioned here. But that was all planned by Lorenzo Ricci. That was all planned. All this so-called 
banishment by European kings, the king of Portugal, the king of Spain, the king of France, throwing the Jesuits out at the time, even before 1773, when the Pope finally banished the Jesuits so-called for, forever. That was all planned by the Jesuits themselves. And now you're going to say, oh, they're going to do that, but then they're going to go against their own people. Yes, of course they do. They kill their own people with masses. They don't care because they have the motto, the end justifies the means. And when the end, when in the end the church, the Roman Catholic Church, is the gainer of the action that has to be taken, every action has to be taken because the end justifies the means. Okay, I'm going to end this little excursion from me here, but I'm going to go back reading what John Adams wrote. And um, I, will, I will start over again. So, uh, John Adams wrote here, quote, I do not like the resurrection of the Jesuits. They have a general now in Russia, Tadeusz Brzozowski, in correspondence with the Jesuits in the United States, who are more numerous than everybody knows. Shall we not have swarms of them here in the shape of printers, editors, writers, schoolmasters, etc.? I have lately read Pascal's letters over again, meaning Blaise Pascal's provincial letters helped bring about the suppression of the society, and four volumes of the history of the Jesuits. If ever any congregation of men could merit eternal perdition on earth and in hell, it is this company of Loyola. Our system, however, of religious liberty must afford them asylum. But if they do not put the purity of our elections to a severe trial, it will be a wonder. Unquote. Now, the last two sentences. Listen very, very careful. Our system, however of religious liberty must afford them an asylum. Yeah. Isn't that what you got with your constitution? Freedom of religion? To whom did that give freedom? Did that give freedom to the protestants in your country who were the overwhelming majority of the population with 99%, even plus 99% at the time of 1776? Or did that bring liberty and religious freedom to the Catholics who were, in the time of the colonies until 1776, forbidden to practice mass out in the open? Meaning they could not have their Eucharist? and who were not allowed to, take, to partake in politics. They could not have any official position within government of the colonies at that time. Because the protestant who made the rules at that time knew that when you give Rome even the tip of your little finger, you lose your whole arm and a lot more. You will give them a way in. Freedom of religion. In 1776, that was one of the basic founding stones of the United States of America, was the end of religious freedom for Protestants because they invited the enemy in and they gave the enemy every possibility now to practice mass to open churches seminaries to preach from pulpits their idolatrous religion and the protestant lost it all our system, however, 
of religious liberty must afford them an asylum. But if we do not put the purity of our elections to a severe trial, it will be a wonder. If they do not put the purity of our elections to a severe trial, it will be a wonder. Now, look back from 2015 to what John Adams said about 1814 with the reinstallment of the Jesuit order and see where it gotten you today in the United States of America. Jefferson's reply indicates or pretends that he, too, was unaware that America's destiny had been shaped by the hands of Rome. Quote, like you, Adams, I disapprove of the restoration of the Jesuits, which seems to portend a backward step from light into darkness. Unquote. During the next 70 years, Superior Generals John Rotan, from 1829 to 1853, and Peter John Bex, from 1853 to 1883, just a little note from me here. I didn't check it yet, but I'm going to check that in the future. I guess that these two generals, by just by their names, were coming from the Netherlands, of were Flemish, Belgian from that time. When you hear these names, and when you know how many generals came from that country, or this little, you know, uh, Benelux, as we call it, Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg, region in history it's astonishing how many generals came from here the latest was hans peter kolvenbach who was responsible for 911 he was from the 1980s until 2008 they say that he resigned which also would have been a first time ever that the jesuit general resigns so I do not believe that he ever resigned. I think he still pulls the strings from the back. Anyway, during the next 70 years, Superior Generals John Rotan, between 1829 and 53, and Peter Jean Bex, between 1853 and 1883, would pump the society up to its original greatness, meaning the time before its so-called suppression swelling the membership from a few hundred to more than 13,000. In those same 70 years, 70 years, interesting number, eh? the Protestants who had fought for America's independence would vastly diminish in proportion to the influx of fresh Roman Catholic refugees from European tyrannies. <laughs> Shall I read that again? Take a good look where we are in 2015, what Tupper Saucy writes here in this book of 1996 published. In those same 70 years, the Protestants who had fought for America's independence would vastly diminish in proportion to the influx of fresh Roman Catholic refugees from European tyrannies. So, in Europe, Catholics flee most and for all from Italy and Ireland. How many of your immigrants over the United States of America have Italian or Irish roots? Hmm? Those were Catholic countries. Does that remind you of 2015, where the border to the south is open to let every Mexican who wants to and every other person who comes from Middle or Latin America, Latin America, why is it called Latin America? Because it is under control of the Latin Roman Catholic Church since centuries. Your borders in the south are open to flood United States of America with Roman Catholic refugees. And at the same time, we in Europe experience the second best thing. We are already Catholic over here in Europe except for a few persons because I'm not Catholic but the states here are Catholic and they flood us with Islam which is the second best thing because Islam 
is just Roman Catholicism for Arabs. And they put them in here. And what's the result? Uh, probably the same. They have a much less IQ and they are absolutely fundamental in their religious opinion. Martyrs, as they call themselves. And you have a lot of those also coming from the South of America into the United States of America now in 2015. So you see that what we experience today is nothing new. There is nothing new under the sun. It all has been there already before. Within these 70 years, they will have fresh Roman Catholic refugees from European tyrannies. European tyrannies. And what are they selling us over here in Europe today? These people are fleeing from Middle East tyrannies and war and persecution. And we have to take them exactly the same as you over there in the United States of America did 150 years ago and are doing today with the open border in the South. The author continues, there is evidence these tyrannies were Jesuit fed. <laughs> you don't want me to go into that, how all the tyrannies of today, whether in the South of America, meaning Latin America, or in the Middle East, are all Jesuit led. Right? Because then we aren't done for another 24 hours. <laughs> and I don't want to continue that reading that long. For the express purpose of populating America, there is evidence these tyrannies were Jesuit fed for the express purpose of populating America with Roman Catholics, first and for all, I have to add here. Perhaps a new scholarship will investigate more thoroughly than I have time or inclination for. Well, Tapa, I just did your job. I just told the listeners that everything that happened in this 70-year reign of the two Jesuit superiors, generals John Rotan and Pierre, Peter Jean Bex, between 1829 and 1883, would pump the society up to its original greatness and would work for the agenda of the Roman Catholic Church to put Roman Catholic refugees from European tyrannies to the United States of America who were before that time 99 plus percent inhabited by Protestants. By 1850, Roman Catholicism already was the biggest quote-unquote denomination in the United States of America. It's just 80 years after 1776. And I say quote-unquote denomination because Roman Catholicism, Roman Catholicism is not Christianity. It has nothing to do with Christianity. And when you call yourself a Christian and are participating in the Roman Catholic Church, please read your Bible and follow God's word as he mentions in Revelation 18 verse 4. Come out of her, my people. Isn't that what uh, it's, it's state, stated in the Bible? Revelation 18 verse 4. Let's go there. Maybe you have to, under, to, to hear it completely again to understand it. This is most and for all for all the Roman Catholics who are honest people who want to be in the servitude of Jesus Christ but are caught in the lie of Roman Catholicism and all the so-called Protestants who are members of Rick Warren Settleback Church and, I don't know, um, Kenneth Copeland's Church and are going to Methodists and Baptists and Lutheran churches who are all Jesuit infiltrated, who all preach from the pulpit another gospel than that from the Bible, 
all these people I call to. Revelation 18 verse 4 And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Come out of her, my people, God's people, Jesus following people, loving people who love the Bible, who love Jesus Christ, but who are betrayed by the teachings of man. As America's public became increasingly Catholic, Generals Rotan and Bex were able to signify Washington's debt to the Black Papacy with much bolder iconographic and architectural symbols. This little explored material is the subject of our next chapter. Chapter 22 of Rulers of Evil, which is called The Immaculate Conception. Something I will continue with the next reading, because I think I gave you stuff enough to think about with the reading I just did. I hope you learned something about what I just said and read, and I hope you take it to heart and look into your heart and ask Jesus what He wants you to do, not what you want to do, but what He wants you to do. You have a saving personal relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ, something that the Pope forbids you. When you have that saving personal relationship with Jesus Christ, ask Him what to do. And I know the answer He will give you. Come out of her, my son. Come out of her, my sister, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Come out of her, my people, my brethren, my bride. Thank you very much for listening. Until next time. God bless you all and bye-bye.